lovely place. Thank you for, to BFF, of course, where I've served on the board for a uh, number of years, and also to Family Enterprise Exchange, Bill, and you and your crew for inviting me to share some thoughts about uh, a topic uh, we need to get prepared for. We're going to talk about leadership, and of course, leadership is the most <clears throat> studied, written about topic in the management field. Nothing even comes close to the number of articles, books, et cetera, written on this topic. So it's gotten a lot of attention. And you can be overwhelmed by the different thinkers and the different frameworks on leadership. Let me try to introduce a few simple ways of thinking about this topic as, as at least academics do. And let me <laughs> say, beginning, um, I am an academic. That's a <laughs> confession. Um, uh, Made me an apology. Uh, I, I try to um, balance what I bring to the table as a researcher, teacher, etc., with the, the work I do internationally now with, um, with families on all kinds of practical issues that families are interested in uh, getting ahead of or challenges that they need to address, et cetera. So I come to you all uh, very grounded, um, very pragmatic, I think in a very uh, simple way about the important things we have to do. So uh, here's, here's how the, the literature on, on leadership gets cut up. One, <clears throat> you can think about the attributes of a leader. What kinds of personal characteristics or approaches does a leader have? And we're going to be talking more about that in a minute. It's like, you know, honesty, integrity, kind of the Boy Scout motto in a lot of ways. But beyond that, you know, is this person uh, agreeable to change? Does, it, does this person search out change, et cetera? Characteristics, attributes. The second are the actual behaviors that a, that a, that a leader would um, uh, exhibit. So how good are they at creating a, a vision or a sense of meaning in, um, in whatever group they're leading? And the third type of bucket or uh, category is what do we expect leaders to accomplish? Not much, is, not much attention is given to that until we're putting someone in a leadership role. Then we think about what is it that we expect leaders to accomplish, not just behave, not just do, et cetera, not just be, but bring to us. So if you think about the, the first topic, um, what are leaders like? Um, people have, I think, pretty consistent ideas about, pretty consistent, not entirely consistent ideas if we, if we did a little survey in this room and I asked you to list the top five attributes of a leader, we would, we would have a longer list than five, but not a huge list. There would be a lot of agreement on the personal characteristics, attributes of a good leader. If, if I asked you what should a leader do, well, you would ask this natural question here, what are you leading? Because if you, depending on what you're leading, you need to do some different things. So if you're leading a business, well, it depends on really the scale of the business, maybe even the type of the business. If you're leading a company that is essentially a laboratory filled with scientists, you're going to lead that differently, probably, than a, a business that is a huge manufacturing concern. There are some different things you have to be good at, and there are some different behaviors or activities that you need to be uh, capable of and doing in order to lead properly. 
So if you're leading a business, there's a certain set of things. If you're leading a family business system, that's even more complicated. You have to be good at some things like compromise, like uh, negotiation, like whatever, in this system that you may not need to be good at if you're just leading a business. And then, and we know a lot about family business leadership. We know this is a framework that I developed years ago, very um, embedded in the work that we do at, at my firm. Uh, to get a high-performing company, we all know you need very capable and aligned management, a good organization. But in the family business field as well, we know that this is also important. You need a good cadre of family owners, uh, people that are very aligned on where we're going, how we're going to get there, you know, the important values that, that we think are uh, driving our success, things like that. You have to have that, and also people that get along pretty well and also don't take too much from the company that, they've, that they own. And then at the base here, of course, is a family that is not only united and uh, industrious, hardworking, but also can contribute in certain ways, at least as owners, maybe as board members, perhaps as managers, and in other ways outside the company. So the point is, the point is that depending on what you're leading, you need to be good at some things and uh, expressing some actions, behaviors that will help whatever it is you're leading be successful. Okay, so what if you're leading this? A business, there are different pathways that families take in this field. There, there are families that really focus almost entirely around their operating company. Leading this kind of situation can be different than if you have a mix of operating companies and investments outside the business, and it's different as well with this uh, path. What if you're a financial family? The point is, what you're leading makes a difference to how you describe a good leader. And many of us um, need to be thinking about not just leading a family company, but leading this family enterprise system, looking at all of the family's assets and activities that are meaningful to them, and asking the important question, what is our purpose? Where do we want to go? What are our guiding values? The what matters. And in our view, uh, leaders of systems need to be good um, visionaries and help the group think about their vision, good architects of the ownership, the governance, etc., and then finally, good integrators, people that really see how things interconnect and get people moving in the right direction. So, short course on how we think about leadership. Now, what we know is that things are changing. Duh. Yes, things are changing. <laughs> what isn't changing? What isn't changing? When I moved to MIT earlier this year, um, it was in good part due to the fact that I, now at, uh, after four decades of helping families thinking about these issues, um, and very conscious of how much is in motion today, I wanted to be in an environment where I could learn and think more about what is coming at us. And so if you think about what is coming at us, what are the forces of change and, the for and disruptive forces? Not every change, not every force acting on us is a disruptor. 
that word is overused today. Disruption means literally that it, it changes what we do and also our, our approach to doing things, not just in business, but in our families, for example. So what are some of these forces? Well, the environmental degradation that we're facing, which is very serious, offering though both opportunities and challenges to us. Uh, technological advances and digital disruption. This, is, this gets about 85% of the attention when we're talking about change. It deserves a lot of attention. The um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, is heavy on this. They should be. And, uh, but there's also globalization, which is affecting us. And finally, a lot of socio-political economic, it's a grab bag of things that I put together over here. But think about this, the fact that uh, Generation X and the Millennials or Generation Y are coming on stream. New consumer patterns are developing. That, in addition to technological advances, makes the consumer or customer much more powerful today than he or she was even five or six years ago. Forcing customers to customize, customize, customize as much as possible to reach their, or to convince their customers to buy what they have. Um, so these factors together are influencing what? Well, they're influencing how we work. In many industries, it's already vastly changed how we do work um, and how we do business. It's, it's affecting certainly how we sell, how we communicate. It's also, it's also affecting where we do business. And what are, the, what are the international qualities that one needs to have, not just language, but understandings, in order to develop you know, customers abroad or sources of supply abroad, globalization is it's like globalization, I say, is like throwing gasoline on a fire, the fire caused by technological change. And it just spreads it. It, makes, it magnifies the force of technology. Um, but get this. Uh, this would fall over here. We're getting older as a world and people are living a lot longer. Now, personally, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Not complaining. Great, great, great. Uh, and we're all, our active lives are much longer now. About 10 years longer in active life than a generation ago. Think of that. And with some advances, it could stretch out. So I know lots of business leaders in their 70s, maybe touching 80, who are still very active, very engaged, good minds, good bodies, et cetera. They love the game. They want to keep playing the game. With next generations, next generations, expecting leadership roles, responsibilities, inclusion in important decision making far earlier, far younger than we've ever seen it. So the expectations of the young are becoming more aggressive, I should be further along, I should have more, and the, the expectations of the older are I, I want to stay around, I want to keep playing the game, and so these demographic forces are influencing a lot of organizations that I know. We could go on and on and on. I see literal changes to just about every aspect of your family, family business, broader family enterprise. We should get ready for that. And just last week I was speaking at a, at a conference where we were exploring how boards of directors need to change. 
in order to adjust, adapt, blah, 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 to the changing world. And they do. But if that's true, well, doesn't leadership also need to adapt? Do we need to develop new capabilities as leaders? Do we need to develop different approaches or viewpoints as leaders? What are we learning? Well, we've at the Cambridge Institute, which is part of my organization, we've been paying attention to, actually to a larger group than this, uh, next generation leaders, looking at what are they like? What, what, um, what are their inherent capabilities? What are their approaches to things? And is it changing? And I'm gonna show you what we're finding. And so this group of kind of esteemed next generation leaders is helping us. We've done a lot of work with them to think about the future, but it extends beyond them. And what are we learning? Number one, the, the leaders that we think are most adaptive in this new globalized world have a global approach. What does that mean? Well, they're excited by globalism. They're not intimidated at all. It's fun, interesting for them. They have global operating skills, including the languages that they need to move around but also the understandings of how business is done in different places. They're pretty mobile, and they're what we call, uh, the most advanced of these we call cultural chameleons, that you drop them any place in the world and they just kind of fit in. Uh, second, um, experimental and adaptive. These are people that not just manage change, they seek it. They're excited by change. They, they seem uh, not only agile mentally, like you, you, you put a new kind of problem uh, in front of them, and they can kind of flex and think in different ways, liking to think in different ways, in order to approach it. Very growth uh, and learning oriented. They have an appetite for risk. You know, they, they don't worry too much if they fail as long as they learn. Three, change makers. Now, as I go through this list, I won't say that everybody that, every younger leader that we work with is strong in all of these ways. Most people have a lot of strengths, a few developmental needs, we would say. Uh, change makers. Um, embracing change. Uh, really kind of enjoy coming up with a vision that we can go after. They welcome diversity. They tend to be talent magnets. They get it that uh, business success today and also family success uh, comes from having the right people at the table and attracting them, retaining them, motivating them. Um, these are people also that we watch and see that they're, they're good at getting consensus pretty quickly. They're into movement. They're into forward progress. And uh, we like to say also that they're interpersonally courageous. The best among them are really good at talking to people about performance issues. I think you're good in this way, but you've got to, you really have to improve over here. And just saying it in a respectful way, but not shying away from it. Okay, that's number three. Number four. Where's number four? Here it is. Ah, there it is. Um, purpose and value driven. Values driven, sorry. Um, very motivated by having a mission, having values, um, innovative thinking. Uh, really good at encouraging others in what we call shared meaning putting out that vision and why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this? What's our, what's our mission here? Uh, authenticity, this is who I am, let me express that. I'm not gonna try to just be um, a kind of a cut out cardboard leader. This is me, I've got strengths, I've got weaknesses, and connecting well with others. Some of this stuff seems boilerplate, but it's part of the pattern here. Now, number five, 
this has been uh, changing. Um, it used to be, I've now been around long enough that I'm, I've actually, you know, I would say four gener, I've worked with four generations. Uh, I, I worked with a generation before me, it's 40 years, so you can see how this works, right? Long time. Uh, been people in my generation, and then Generation X, and Generation Y. Um, so I've seen some of these movements firsthand mm -hmm. over a period of time, and this is one of them. In my generation, and I think certainly in the generation that came before, there was a sense that you, you anchor yourself with your career, and then you build a successful life around that. But work comes first. I mean, let's be practical. You've got to make something, and you've got to earn a living, and you've got to do useful things in life. That comes first. Then we live. Well, Generation X comes around, comes along, and they say, no, it doesn't feel exactly right. I think we ought to balance work and life. It ought to be more even. The millennials come along, and they're saying, my life is the most important thing, and I'll structure some work around it, right? It's, it is exactly flipped, in my view, over the course of these three generations. So, the, the new leaders, in a, in a, I think in a successful way, but we're gonna learn how this works by watching them. They say their whole life is a priority, they're interested in total health. And when they, th when they talk about you know, how I think, how I, how I um, maintain my mental health, my physical health, my very soul, they mean it. These are people that are much more committed to total health than certainly people in my generation ever talked about or ever did until maybe more recently. Um, Managing their personal energy, really understanding not, not to drive themselves to exhaustion, but really pacing themselves and getting enough exercise, et cetera. What I call, this is my term, brutal time management, which um, I think in my generation, we basically were terrible at it. And increasingly, the, the later generation X and Y um, are better at it in the sense that they know how to create boundaries around the things that are really meaningful to them and sticking with it. And then uh, customized self-development, again, they're very learning oriented and they do these things. So this is a pillar. It's not just an add-on, not just a nice thing to do. It's part of what they're here to do. And then finally, they integrate. They integrate all of this. They integrate all of this together. Um, and to do that, they like to get up here and look at where things are going and where their life is going and, and how they can make changes to make things better. I think they're, they've got a, a skill at getting up here and thinking more broadly than I think, but I, but when you're, when you're in a quickly changing world, you better get up here. You better get some altitude from time to time and take a look at where things are going. Because if you stay down here in the weeds, you're gonna be surprised. And if you get up there a little bit, you may have some time to adapt. So, this is the profile of leaders that we think are going to be not only most adaptive to change, but people who are going to make change happen. This is, this is what we think are characteristics that matter most. Now, again, of these several areas, uh, any of us, I mean, 
Th these are the new categories that I would propose we look at, but um, they're not just for young people. Anybody can learn and adapt to do more of these things, but I think, and, I, and I'm not even sure if all of these things are necessary for success, but I do think this is the new way that leadership is being expressed now. So, um, we're gonna hear from Phil Dessert about his leadership journey and that of his family and here's some of the, the movement in leadership style that Phil's family has made, but also some of the uh, attitudes, capabilities, approaches that Phil feels uh, make him uh, adaptive and successful. One last thing I wanna just put a plug in for. At MIT, one of the reasons, again, that I went there is because I wanted to figure out, as best I could, using a lot of the resources of the school and other places, where Family Enterprise is going. And I am launching two programs for later stage family companies. This is second, going to, second generation, third, fourth, and this is the founder stage moving at some point into the second generation. And both of these programs are going to be grounded in not just what are the current topics and issues, but where are we going in the future and how do we get ready? So this is something that I offer to you to think about. And now we're gonna hear, you've heard from the professor. Now we're gonna hear from somebody that knows what he's talking about, <laughs> which is a person who's living this um, Day to day, Phil Dessert. Phil. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk a bit about Dessert, or Mayor Dessert, or my other sign for the Quebecers. Um, we've been around for over 110 years. We've been through generations. The company changed, and I'm going to give you a brief history of the 110 years, and then my journey through that, and what I'm doing now, and what my next steps have been across that. So we'll start with Omar. So in 1908, Omar is my great grandfather. He purchased a steel mill. He was 27 years old. His, his father before him, successful business uh, financier in Montreal, pushed him out on his own entrepreneurial ways. Now, Omar did really, really well. He became, he built the company. He built the foundation. He bought a steel mill. It became, it eventually became the largest distributor of uh, hardware supplies, construction supplies, and all the above in Montreal. Um, he would be on the floor, he talked to his staff, he worked with the people, and he was always a people's person. That's probably why he succeeded. There's a few other things that helped. He was French-Canadian. French-Canadians in Montreal buy from French-Canadians. And as Quebec was growing, well, there was a lot of construction, there was growth. It was a vibrant uh, period in the city. There were 6,000 constructions per year, and Oman was able to grow with a lot of that. Now, that's the good side. Well, the first year, he didn't make payroll. He had to go get another loan from his father. Probably not the funnest thing to do. Um, the recession hit. We all heard about it. Sales dropped within six months by 50%. And he went out and reached out to the local business people and the local consultants at the time. Am I doing the right thing? He was afraid. And everyone said, you're doing it. Just don't lay off people. We, we don't need that more in the market. And he just kept on going. Um, so that was... That was some of his successes. The other was the, some of his failures, pardon me. And the last thing is he had gout. His wife, Eugenie, was someone that liked to feed him. And he developed gout, so he was bedridden for a very long time. And that kind of made room for my grandfather, and I'll get into that, how it made room for him to start quite early in the family business as well. Um, he wasn't active in the business, which killed him because he wanted to be and he wasn't allowed to be spoken to, and it drove him nuts, because he really wanted to be in there, and that's probably what led to his demise, and he died of heart disease, um, to the point that my father never met him. So this is one of the pictures of one of the stores, and how Omaya had built the business was he'd start with one building, and then realize it was expanding, and then buy the next building next to it, and then that one's for sale, and just keep on growing. So there'd be these blocks of Omaya on the side in Montreal, 
and they grew. And every time he'd start and buy a building or, or move into a building, the first thing he'd look at was the foundations. Because as he used to say, screws and nails are very, very heavy. <laughs> um, and then, so then the next generation was my grandfather, so Roger. Roger joined in, in the wartime, he was 23, he was one of the first graduates of McGill. So a French Canadian at the time, one of McGill was unheard of. Um, he was a proud French Canadian. And he would say that amongst many places that he was Canadian before French, which as a Quebecer didn't always go by very well, but still he never, did it nevertheless. Um, he started as a sales clerk. He went to McGill. After that, his father brought him in at 23, and he sold sporting furniture, which he loved, sporting goods, pardon me, which he loved. That was his fun. Um, but he had to move around, and he learned the business very, very quickly. And ultimately, as the business grew, and his father being ill, he, uh, he had to take leadership roles. And he was 27 when he really started taking over the company in full force. So I'll just take a step back. Well, Maya was 27 when he, when he bought the steel mill. Roger was 27 when he got in, and yes, there's a trend to this. Um, and Roger really built it. He built it large. He had plumbing, he created a plumbing, I'll move forward and I'll come back after, but he had a huge plumbing facility that he had north of the city in Montreal, which was the first of its kind. You can see three bay doors at the time was very unheard of. He was trying to revolutionize the market. There were there was everything in that store. You would buy your sporting goods to your washer dryer to your color TV. It was the everything store for all French Canadian families. That was the good side. And Grand Papa was very good across the business, but he traveled a lot. He was the first French Canadian president of the Chamber of Commerce of Canada. He was in the news. He was very involved politically, which politically on the, on the directorship, but that took him time away from the company. So growth was great when he was there, but then things slowed down. Um, and I'll go back, and one of the challenges that he faced was sourcing during the wartime. Now, he was 23, but he had to, to find these supplies. And I remember him telling me stories about um, he would drive down to South Carolina during the war to pick up a crate of nails. And Grand Papa, why do you pick up a crate of nails? It's, not, it's barely not worth the metal. And the story was, it's not worth the metal but everyone will remember where they got those nails when there are no more nails in the market. So that was his lost leader to bring it in. Um, other, other challenges that, grew, that, that pushed the company was the rise of big blocks retailers. So at, you might have heard of this company, which was in common at the time, which was essentially what we could have become, which is Canadian Tire. He, that was a competitor. Um, and then the last nail in the coffin was our offices were in, a, in the east side of Montreal. So for those that know Montreal, the Barry and St. Catherine. Well, if you look, there's huge amounts of social housing that moved into that neighborhood, which dropped a lot of the consumers that, that purchased substantially from the Sarah. And then the, and next what happened was we got expropriated. So all the buildings that the family business we're in, we were, were moved aside so that we could have the University of Quebec in Montreal, so for the UCAM. And my, at that point, my grandfather's in his 60s, late 60s, does he want to reinvent retail? Does he want to get back in, put his energy back in? You, if the competitors at the time would be the hardware stores, the Canadian tires, the Ronas that were starting to grow, and on the other side, well, you had the Bay, you had Eaton's, you had these flagship stores, um, and the World Wars, for those who remember that, that were in that area. And he just didn't have it. His business ventures, his other ventures were doing well. And at that point, he just took the direction elsewhere. So he started liquidating. And he liquidating, and he had a son that started buying. So my father's an opportunist, amongst many other things, as he saw the challenges. But he started as the business. There was only three employees. His job was to liquidate inventory to get rid of it and push, and he just kept buying. So that, <laughs> that opportunity for him was Lucam was the largest fine arts department in Canada that was being built. His store was across the street, so he just kept on buying. And that three employees clerk, well, he kept on buying. Now, this is in the late 70s, and the ad agencies are growing. Ad agencies, ad agencies at the time were buying these sheets called Letraset which is an eight and a half by 14, or a 17 depends a sheet, 
and it had letters or fonts that you would scratch on, well, pretty much anything, but mostly paper that the ad agencies would use to design their clients' logos. Well, he, one, had a wall, probably double the size of this board right here, full of boxes, yay big, and he would guarantee one hour delivery. So, he was selling to the ad agencies one hour delivery, and they didn't care how much it cost, as long as they could get it. He made a killing. <laughs> he was phenomenal, it was great, and that's really started the growth. But that, in 1980, Letraset and Letraset derivatives were about 40% of sales. By 1990, they were less than five. And why was that is, well, Apple Computer came in, and you could just click and have a font, and that simplified everything across the board. So Dad's thought was, well, if my consumers or my customers are going to Apple, well, I'll become an Apple dealer. So he became an Apple dealer for a few years. And that was a great idea, but for those that knew that know how distribution and computer works, especially Apple, it's brutal. You don't control your inventory, you don't control your sales, you don't control your geography, you don't control your stock, and you don't control your prices. And that's a distribution company. Dad couldn't do it. <laughs> and unfortunately, he sold it, and the people that bought it knew exactly what they were doing, so they went belly up two years later. <laughs> um, and going back, and how Dad grew, is he just, he, his point of view as a fine arts market is a very small market. And his competitors, most of whom were artists that were building art supply stores so they could get their own product for, for substantially cheaper. They were not business people. So that thought was, I'll just slowly buy part, uh, parts of the market, and he kind of cornered the market. And that's how he grew. Um, when you offer 50 cents on the buck on inventory, well, I'll take that and run. Uh, and that's how we grew. So now at 34 stores, there's some organic growth and a lot of acquisition through that. But now we're having this thing called the internet, <laughs> which has been a big challenge that Dad has gone through. Um, here's just a quick, so that was his stint with Apple computers. It lasted only two years, which is good. Um, the Omaila Sound, the material art store, that was, that building has been expropriated and it was gone, but that was his first store. Um, and then for the bottom, well, he diversified. In the late 90s, he realized that he believed he had 75% of the market, um, but the market wasn't only the artist. If you buy Crayolas for your kids, that's the market too. And that's where he realized that he could diversify in still a creative way and keep on growing. And so in the late 90s through 2007 or so, there's a massive expansion that was really based on who else can be my customer that is not properly served at the moment. Well, that's fine and dandy, so then it gets to me. Um, I was raised in business. My mom is a CA. She taught at McGill for many, for about 15 years. Um, I learned what an opportunity cost was very young. It was either two cookies or a brownie. <laughs> um, so when undergrad in business, and when I understood how business really worked after undergrad, I went to work for the real world and realized I knew nothing. Um, I worked for the Bay and at Metro and learned a lot and realized that I need to go back to school and that's where I did an MBA. Great learning, I knew it all, and that's where Dad said, now that you know it all, come on, join the family business. It was very easy to join the family business. He said, Phil, come on in. Our head office is in Montreal. Quebec is where we're, we're big and grow. You can be anywhere but Quebec. So my options were either Toronto or Vancouver. I so I went to Vancouver. I started with one store as a store manager, because I have to start from the bottom up. And then two stores, and it kept on growing. But retail, I, I'm kind of like my father in that sense, that knows the beginning of the conversation. And now being out far, I could try a lot of new things, which is fine and dandy, but it's still family business. So that was Dad's theory, is learn from the ground up. You need to know if you're gonna be if you eventually you want to take over and run, we need to know how the real world works and how our staff and our customers and how they interact with us on a day-to-day -day basis. So I learned the reality of the business. And retail is tough. Retail, it's a margin game and it's, it's a difficult one. Fortunately, my boss, who is not my father, uh, was really good. He, his first conversation every time we'd speak was, do you know this? And he'd say that because my father would often tell me one version of the story and I had Morris's version of the story and I had to, to balance between these two versions. And who was right? I'm not even getting into that one. Um, 
But that was, that was five years. Now, what's next? And I was curious, what do I do beyond this? Um, but let's take that step, and I've alluded to it a few times, is retail is not in a good position these days. It's in a huge sense of turmoil. Consumers are changing. We don't know how they're changing, but everyone knows they're changing. Every consultant has an answer for you and says, this is how you should do it, this is what you do. But that changes every six months, oh, because the reality is changing. Now they'll charge the fees and it becomes challenging. But ultimately, no one really knows what's happening. And competitors that are still alive are racing to the bottom. It's a, it's a, it's a price war. It's the consumer is going to lose in the long run. But ultimately, these, fam these businesses are gone. If you look at North America, for the last five years, we've lost anywhere between 4,000 and 8,000 retail stores a year. That's a lot of retailers. The online game is becoming very challenging. Now, me, at the time, I'm 35 years old. Well, I want to grow in the company. But the company is in a state of change. Now is, is now the time that dad really wants to change. And he says, well, if you want to come back for the business, I have nothing for you at West. You have to come back to Montreal. I like BC. <laughs> BC is fun. <laughs> So that's the challenge that I have to think of. And I broke it down onto two different sides. So if I stay in Vancouver, I'm Phil Dessert. My name means nothing, and that's in some cases really enjoyable. It's also harder because if I need to meet family friends, well, all of them are on the other side, which makes it a little bit harder. So my simpler life is in BC. The easier life is in Montreal. Um, if I'm in Vancouver, my boss is far. I, at the end of the day, I can do what I wish. My father, he's supposed to come more often in VC since I was there. He actually came less because business was good. <laughs> in Montreal, I would have limited freedom. So I would fit, I'd be within the company, I would be within my box, but it would be comfortable within my box. I could walk in, I could walk out, and it's simple. Now I say financial certainty and uncertainty because yes, I would have a career in the family business in Montreal, but there is no financial certainty. So that's where the asterisk kicks in. West Coast living and Montreal. So Whistler, Trombone, nightlife, it's, it, it was a challenging decision. That one is tough, but West Coast is a fun place to be, but Montreal nights out are a lot of fun too. Um, out West, I have no expectations. No one's expecting anything from me. In Montreal, as I said a little higher up, I'm just there before Phil. And the eyes are on me, and the challenge is there. Is this the fourth generation that's going to screw up the company? Is that what's going to happen? And that's a tough one. And then lastly, well, we moved there. I moved there five, six years, five and a half years ago. And I've made friends. I had a lot of friends. But my family and my childhood friends and my undergrad are all in Montreal. Those were the, the big decisions that I was facing, um, and which brought me to the next steps, which was, what does leaving look like? Because ultimately, I decided to stay in Vancouver. I wanted to be true to myself. I wanted to keep on going. And if I looked at the history of the three generations prior to me, is ultimately, they each put the company in their own way. They grew it their own way. They did their own thing without having limitations of the predecessors. And I'm not doing it because of them. I'm proud of being in this air, but I'm also doing it for me, which was a challenge. Um, and that where the timing kicked in with the Business Family Foundation. Now, I'm not doing a pitch for them, but the timing was perfect. Um, I fell into their entrepreneurship program. And what that did is it gave credibility to my skills from members within the family, but also from outside the family. So as consultants are giving us a hand to mount a business plan and mount a lot of things like that. For those that have graduate business degrees, it was slightly redundant, but still very interesting in the sense that it pushed me to do things that I know I should do, but you don't always do, i.e. market research and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, it helped me start something from nothing. Now I'm going to put that caveat on nothing because it's not true. I have support from the family. In the sense, my office is locked up in a store. It's a shelf, and it looks great. I would never bring customers there. Um, I don't have to worry about my accounting. I don't have to worry about finance. It's my area, so, but it helps. But as that happened, I had to hire my replacements. So I hired my replacements, and this is 
by May 2017, Dad and I had this discussion, and we agreed that we'll do a slow exit for me to leave at Christmas, so 20, Christmas 2017, which was this last Christmas. So I hired my replacements, which was very interesting. I trained my replacements, which was very interesting, so I brought them up to what I had built over the previous five years, and then took a step out. Letting, that was challenging, because I'd worked so hard for that. Um, I wanted the business to continue and succeed, but also I wanted myself to continue to succeed. In 2018, when I walked in less as a manager, now as someone with the name on the front door, but that's about it, it was hard to let go because I don't necessarily want to go in and help that client. I can't tell that staff to do this. I can't. I have to walk in and cross my arms and not do anything. And the things that I did learn is startups are tough. I have a lot of respect for people that start companies on their own. It is not easy going into doing your own thing day in, day out with very little validation. And it builds grit, and it's a lot of fun, but it's hard. So what that brought me is I took my skill set. What do I know? I've been raised in retail since I've been a kid. And retail, the joy about retail is it touches everything. It touches technology, it touches real estate, it touches finance, it touches, like, name it, it touches everything, which put me to focus on what does retail really need? And it needs efficiency. Um, so I took my biggest pain point as a manager from Desert, which was managing staff. Staff schedules, communicating with staff, and all that window, managers aren't helped. They're squeezed by senior management that needs more out of them to go get those sales, but management also has to squeeze lower. So the managers have to squeeze the staff that are minimum wage employees that are trying to make ends meet. Management is tough, especially, and then you're getting emails, you're getting constant amounts of tools, of no tools, but pressure to succeed. We need to give more pressures, and we need to give more tools to managers, and that's what I built. Um, so I built a scheduling software that took, it used to take me over four hours to do a schedule every week with about 20, 25 staff. I brought it down to about half an hour, and that's with all the same, and there's actually more efficiencies. Um, there's next steps to this, and the company is called Sked Guru. And there's next step is how to create that communications between senior management staff, uh, management and staff, to give them a helping hand. Okay. We're testing. We're in about a dozen stores now. Two two outside Desert stores that have that have come on board last week, and it's taking up slowly. It's a tech company, but it, it's slowly growing. Um, and that brought back to the discussion with my father. So where do I fit within this air? Am I, is the door still open? If, as startups are challenging, can I come back to the foundation? And the answer is, a f yes, the door is not closed. It's just not the door I want to take now. So if and when my father, who is 65, who loves what he's doing, is not going to go anywhere, planning on not going anywhere, um, when he, if and when he makes that decision, well, that'll be for me to if and when to make that decision as well. I have been in, I love the company, I'm proud of it. But it's also, I need to do my own thing to be proud of myself within these companies. Um, what does the future hold? I have no idea. But I know I'm gonna have fun and keep on playing with it. That's it.